know that Mr. Farrar, Mr. Farrar was one of those strange mystics belonging to secret orders in Islam. Strange mystics belonging to secret orders in Islam. They create a situation to create an effect that will open up the way for the, for the real work to come in time. And they created it, they create something that's against the end result. It ain't for the end result, except as an influence. And as a situation to put people in, to put people in, 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 in near the Quran. And their belief is this, that if you have good intentions and you keep insisting upon what is right, you can preach what is wrong, terribly wrong. But uh, the people motivated by, by the spirit of righteousness and the spirit of respect for God, etc., no matter how they perceive God, they will keep their good nature, most of them. They'll keep their good spirit, most of them. And if they ever seriously decide to read the Quran, they will be guided by God. And the Quran will save them and put them on the right path. That's their belief, secret order. He, and I share that with you so you will know that Mr. Farrar, Mr. Farrar was one of those strange mystics belonging to secret orders in Islam. Strange mystics belonging to secret orders in Islam. They on that day, I took a clip uh, of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad um, saying that he uh, once was a Mason. Um, you can hear it on YouTube if you want uh, under uh, the Lost Architect. <laughs>
um, it's the same day, it's the same uh, a meeting. And of course, you all know I had studied Freemasonry, written the books on it, etc. cetera. And um, so you know it was gonna catch my attention that day. So uh, just from my history, um, this shows uh, uh, that connection. And when I met with the Imam for the first time in 87, as you know, and I'll play a little bit of it again, uh, he said uh, it was touchy for him, uh, the masonry, and, and and one is, you know, you have the Illuminati, all of that, um, when dealing with the Europeans, but when it came to our people, just like with Christianity, uh, that was a whole different issue. And uh, we'll play some things where the, the, uh, a lot of those who joined the nation in the 30s, 40s, 50s were Masons, and they gave great help to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, as the Imam just said, we didn't have, sometimes we didn't have no places to meet, and um, uh, they would be the only ones to let us meet in their place. So I'm just going to take a brief moment and let you hear the Imam nominating uh, for the representative body, uh, just to verify that this happened the, the same the same day in the same meeting, and of course, uh, um, I pay close attention to it, and it's an uh, important part of our history. Uh, they will have no authority to make decisions. But what I'm going at this time, I'm going to um, uh, um, um, nominate, well, uh, put some names, not nominate, but put some names before you. Uh, uh, and uh, for you to consider it's for possible uh, positions um, on this representative body. Uh, Dr. Nuruddin, are you here, Dr. Nuruddin? Yes, we stand just in case. I think everyone knows, but just in case we don't know. Uh, Dr. Nuruddin, uh, Imam Khatu Um I don't know if Imam Abdul Malik is here or not, but if he's here, he stand, please stand. Imam Abdul Malik. I'll put that twice. Played that already, as you know. Okay, what I'm going to show you now is what brought Imam Muhammad and I together and our correspondence and our working together concerning. Uh, secret society, uh, Freemasonry and whatnot, but I want to say I did not know what I just played you when I began addressing this subject. I was really going off of the lessons that we had when we was in the Nation of Islam uh, 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 about the 33 degrees and you know who had the most knowledge and that uh, the Europeans was practicing this in secrecy and I was attempting to expose that. But I wasn't aware of the depth of uh, 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 Freemasonry within the Nation of Islam, the history of the Nation of Islam, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and that Farad Muhammad came from a secret society and all of that. And you'll hear later what you heard where Imam Muhammad say it was touchy for him, uh, but giving me some, some sense of direction. So this is leading into the first Muslim Mason dialogue in Washington, D.C. Almost as controversial as Al Islam, Chris Taylor. Your research, you didn't run across that one. If you did, you didn't see any significance in it. 
Very definitely. And with one statement in there, I think that you will way out and you will be able to understand there is a difference between Prince Hall Masonry and other types of masonry. There is a difference. I'm just going to play a small excerpt of this. This was uh, in Washington, D.C. in March 6th. I'm not going to go on. I respect you, gentlemen. I thank you, gentlemen, for your time, your attention, and we love each other as brothers and sisters. We have the same fight. We have the same struggle. And we have to prepare ourselves and pass the knowledge on to the young. I'm a young man, 29 years old. We have to pass it on to the young brothers and sisters that need it. And they may not necessarily want to come into the law. They may want to share with another brother without worrying about the oath of secrecy. Now, the oath may be symbolic, but it's still a hindrance. And if it is free, basically, if it is free to erect a spiritual structure, to lay it over a perfect stone, to bring it from a rough action to a perfect action, if it's free to do it, then let it be free. Don't put the restraints. Let us, as a people, strive for it and advance. And thank you very much, Brother Uphel, and I really appreciate it. Why you the fight you're standing there, you can get a little stretch so you won't. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you must have been born in Arkansas. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to okay. use too much time because most of it's been taken up, but I want to start by saying this. The uh, your, your, the uh, book, Al Islam, Christianity and Freemasonry by Mustafa El Ami is worth reading. And it is emails copies are available. We have some. If, we have if you didn't yeah. purchase one last night, I strongly urge you to uh, purchase one today because uh, it's something that should be on the a must on the reading list of every Mason. I firmly believe that. I don't agree with everything you said. But I have simply to Audio was kind of low. Here is my 29 page book review. It's uh, in the fourth quarter of the Galaxis Magazine, 1986, uh, part one of my book review appeared in the current issue, the first for 87. The second part appeared in the next issue, which will be out in June. Um, the third part will appear. In the they had did a book review and sent me a letter to uh, see if I would participate. You will be able to learn a lot from this. Uh, I want to uh, briefly on the beginning of Islam in America, uh, which is what we should be primarily concerned about today, about Islam in this country. The, as far as we know, the first American convert to Islam was, an Amer was a, a Methodist minister named Reverend Norman. Uh, in the 1870s, he went to Turkey as a missionary. And uh, instead of converting the Turks to Christianity, he converted to Islam. As, this was a black man. And, uh, uh, about a decade later, another white American named uh, Alexander Russell Webb became a Muslim. And he did a lot to advance the cause of Islam in America. In 18, he took the name Muhammad Webb. In 1883, he gave two lectures on Islam at the World's Parliament of Religions that met at the World's Fair in Chicago. It, uh, this was uh, the first one that dealt specifically with the black community was the Moorish Science Temple that started in Newark, New Jersey in 1913, founded by Timothy Drew, who took the name of Noble Drew Ali. And uh, Noble Drew Ali died in Chicago in 1929. And most of you read my article that appeared two years ago in the Galaxis Magazine, the Moorish Science Temple and Religion Influence by Prince Hall Masonry, in which I documented pretty well the fact that Noble Drew Ali borrowed heavily from Masonry in organizing the Moorish Science Temple. Now, he died in 1929. A year later, W.D. Fard and Elijah Muhammad withdrew from the Moorish Science Temple and started the Nation of Islam as a splinter group. Of course, they developed into a much larger organization. 
and Elijah ruled the, the organization until 1975 when he died. At that point, his uh, son, Wallace Muhammad, who later became Warrior Dean Muhammad, uh, took over the organization and uh, changed much of the teaching, as Mustafa Zari brought out, and did everything he could to bring it into conformity with Orthodox or Sunni Islam. Uh, in 1978, there was a split, and there was one group that didn't want to accept the new teachings. And uh, today, Louis Farrakhan heads the uh, what's left of the Nation of Islam, and they uh, still follow the original teachings of Elijah Muhammad. It is, we are of the opinion that indirectly the present uh, movement, what was called the American Muslim Mission, though they don't call it that anymore, uh, is indebted for its very existence to Prince Hall of Freemasonry. Indirectly, Prince Hall of Freemasonry and Prince Hall's Random gave uh, rise to the Moorish Science Temple, which in turn gave birth to the Nation of Islam, and the evolving process goes on. Uh, but, it, but, it, but anyway, this is a place that's going to take this into consideration. And as I, and as I, I brought out in, in my book review, uh, there's no organization that historically has been more committed to the cause of black liberation than the Prince Hall Masonic Fraternity. That's I'd say this, that you way out in that doesn't mean he has to do the same for his brother. They say that uh, the community of Muslims are as one brother, basically, I'm, I'm not quoting it exactly. One thing I'm saying, it would seem difficult for him to have to make a decision between his Masonic brother and his At brother. this point, I'm questioning secrecy. You'll hear the Imam say that in my talk, too. I was questioning secrecy. I might, I might say this, that you're way out in, that, that means there's something, uh, uh, Nathaniel Palm, right? I'm not going to say anything about this, but I'm going to say this. I don't I don't know his Arabic name uh, at this time. Uh, but you're way out in left field when you keep talking about secrecy. Okay. There are no secrets in the Masonic organization. No more than what's contained within you. Okay, but there are. There, there They're private, been, yes. yes there, but didn't you read the book? Yes, there has been. And if it's put in print, the secret is lost. Okay, but what is it? <laughs> it's obvious what he knows. Read the secret. <laughs> no, understand, understand what, what, what I'm saying. In Masonry, there, I mean, I guess the language of the open is you will not reveal what has been revealed. Yes, sir. So there are certain token uh, uh, passwords, etc. Yes. I understand those are your secrets. So, no, 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 no. Did you read them? Did you read them? Did you read them? Then the secret, then you didn't read them. That's what we're trying to tell you. If you can read a secret, I don't care if one man wrote it and one man read it, the secret is lost. Then there's no more secret. So you're talking about a decision by Masonic Fraternity to not reveal secrets. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, sir between Islam and Freemasonry. Freemasonry is compatible with every religion in the world. Okay, if that's my view. Okay. Right, now, every now, religion. Now, let me understand this. Now, I want to make sure that I, that I hear you clear. All right. That there is no secret to Freemasonry. That's what I said. It's right. one secret, and you can't tell it. Okay. If you say it's no secret, then Masonry is, no, is not a... a let let, let me stand up in case somebody didn't hear me. I said there are no secrets in Masonry except one. And I will tell you what it is. And you will see how it cannot be told. What does Freemasonry mean to you? Okay. That's the only secret there is. Brother Payne. Uh, yes, the one point I want to make to the brothers is that there is a secret in Freemasonry. And the and it's God. That's you can't tell that. Well, let, okay, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. If there is no, if that is the only secret, then what I say, or, or if we say about the conference in the square, I mean, you can basically come out in the public and tell them about what the apron means. Right, it every week. If you, you can tell them about the conference in the square, you can tell them what the secret, what the substitute word is without being on the five points of fellowship. Are you, are you telling me? I, you know, the they, 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 did you read that? that? <laughs> no. The masses of the people. Let me ask you a question. We can't all talk. Okay. Okay. The okay. masses of the people generally think Masonry is a secret. Wait a minute, bro. Wait. Just a moment. I'm sorry. Let's, let us understand. We, we can all sing and hum it. It'll be understood and beautiful. 
but we cannot talk and everyone understand what is being said. We have to learn, and, and, and let's, let's do it um, in, in a uh, harmonious way. Okay, run again. Uh, you seem to be well versed on masonry, and I understand that you have never been a mason. Absolutely, never. Where did you get your information? Through research. Does that sound like we're a secret society? <laughs> if it was secret, you would not be able to find it. Well, there are some secrets that have been broken. Understand, it's, maybe it's in, okay, you the mason. If you say there's no secret, I have to accept your word. I can't argue with you and say that there is secret. If you say Mason is not a secret society, there's no secret. I can present certain things that I that I've read and say they're mysteries. But if you say there's no secret in Mason, I can't tell you that that there is. Okay. I can, if, if there if there's no secret, I did research. Uh, let me say one other thing. In your as I told you last night, in your next book, don't quote men like Albert Pike. He was a 300 pound segregationist that lived in my hometown. Okay, when I wrote my book, I was not, yeah, dealing, on a, I was not dealing on a race. I wasn't dealing on a race issue. I was dealing, like I say, with principles, concepts, and ideas. And I was packed, I was tight. Racist as he was, and wherever he is, he probably still racist. Still ain't just devil, they say. <laughs> so. But what I'm saying, no, sir, I, 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 it's just like this book. Right. A lot of Scottish Rite Masons read this book, but they never read the opening statement of the author. Uh -huh. Now, how in the world uh, uh, can you take a man that is against an organization and consider him an expert? Yeah, it just can't be done. You can't take a non-Muslim right. and, and, and proceed right. to tell you, a practicing Muslim, about your religion. Okay. This one I have a question. I'll Someone in the back had a question. One, one point. Thank you for being patient with us. And the fact that we that you invited us here to speak is a definitely a step in the right direction in unifying that and believe me, a lot has been accomplished. What we like to do Brother Daly, come here. Three seconds. We like to present to the Philoxen Society in the first class of Freemason with a copy of the Holy Quran. I'm sure some of you already have it, but just as a presentation, which is one of the best things that a Muslim can give to anyone, anyone is the Holy Quran. And we Thank you for the invitation, and here I'd like to present this to you from myself, from Brother Ahmad Imam, from the Muslim community. Thank you very kindly, and I'm sure you will share it. I'll over to the President and present it to the one have it on this question. You will have it on this question. Gentlemen, you, this is the color code you must have for the day of lunch. Alhamdulillah, it was this first dialogue that Imam Muhammad saw and thought about our relationship. So it was this dialogue as well as, it was this book that led to this dialogue, Al-Islam, Christianity, and Freemasonry. So now this dialogue gets a full page coverage in the Muslim Journal there in 1987. Uh, it was a different editor at that time. But again, um, I am not aware of the connection with the Nation of Islam history and the Freemasons at, at that time. I'm going on the strength of the lessons that we had when we was in the Nation of Islam. So I don't start getting that understanding until after I meet with the Imam and continue to listen to the Imam and he begins to share that and he knows that I'm paying uh, close attention. So this is occurs in the Muslim Journal and then that August is when Imam Muhammad and I, we meet at the um, um, uh, New Medina in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, uh, not by any meeting that was planned. It just, it just happened that way. Now we sent the video to him and this is what we're talking about. You'll hear him say.
Nancy is uh, very, very impressive. Uh, and I do believe that's uh, what you, you're, trying, you're trying to uh, uh, bring bring them to question yeah. the, uh, the the value of, of secrecy, the the, the, um, the legitimacy of secrecy yeah. as they as they practice it. Yeah. And um, I think it, to that extent, you're serving the religion you're serving from the interests of the Muslims, you know. Um, uh, but as I said, that the cause of the, 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 this very sensitive issue of uh, secrecy, masonry, and uh, be truthful with you, uh, I don't, uh, I don't uh, know if we have any uh, grounds to work against these secret orders unless they're practicing something uh, that is uh, uh, harm and detriment to the society of man, you know. I don't think we have, we have, we have grounds to, uh, to, to uh, work against them or to, or to work for the uh, end or uh, termination of this kind of, these kind of orders, you know. I don't, I don't know if we have any, anything to go upon. And, but I do know of a lot of good that many of them are doing, like the Masons, the, the Lions Club, you know, those people like that. They do a lot of good, uh, but at the same time... Uh... So looking back to 1987, 30 years or so ago, um, older now, and Imam reminded me in that meeting, and you can hear the rest of it on YouTube, wasn't long that... Um, uh, they did a lot of good, and it was touchy to them, as he said. Um, and we can see why, as time went on, and he told me to keep that between ourselves, and um, and he would handle it the way he would, and he would uh, be indirect uh, and, and support me, you know, support him on that. Um, but we see why, because it was the, the Masons, his father was a Mason, a lot of the, the older brothers in the early days came in was Masons, and they help the community uh, in a lot of ways. And I'm going to share. Uh, I'm going to continue the conversation. Uh, Imam's comments. Yeah. I played the rest of it so you can hear him say um, you can publish. I'm saying this to you in private, but you can publish that I met with you and I wish you well. And I just want to show you that um, uh, I, I did run an ad with that in there. Um, 
around October, even though that was August, because things were a little different than you. It's a little hard to get something in the in the paper uh, said by the imam. Naturally, you had to verify. So you see, I was very impressed with the presentation, and I wish Mustafa well. Okay, so th th this was in the um, this was in the Muslim Journal, October second, nineteen eighty seven. Okay. I continued and I ran that ad again in the Muslim Journal here on uh, October 9th, 1987. And the Imam said he would support me uh, indirectly. And I'm doing this so I can show you how he did it. You see, I was very, very impressed with the presentation and I wish Mustafa well. So we, can, we, we, we ran this ad uh, several times, video of it. Then we ran it again, uh, November 6th, 1987. Okay, Muslim Mason Dialogue. This is the first dialogue. And this is what brought Imam Muhammad and I uh, together and our relationship grew stronger from there. But I just want to show you something. Now, this is October and this is November, right? Now, he's supporting me indirectly. He said, you know, um, uh, keep this between us. And um, uh, but you can publish that I met with you and I wish you well. Now, I want you to see what happened after that. So now, October 30th, uh, issue of Muslim Journal, uh, uh, I want to share with you, as he said, told me to listen to his lectures, how he would be supporting me and what we're dealing and dealing with this here. Now, in this uh, October 30th, we this is in the Muslim Journal. Here where the Imam says, uh, I was at a meeting. You see this. I was invited by the Lions Club. Some of you might know about the Lions Club. It's a society that does a lot of good, like the, Sh the Shriners and the Masons. They do a lot of good, etc., etc., etc. And then uh, he said he addressed them. Okay. Just want to just want to share this. But my main my main point is I didn't realize the depth of the relationship with our community, the Nation of Islam, uh, and and the and the Freemasons in terms of its history. And and as as I move forward to show you some things that I learned later, as the Imam w w would say things about this. Now October 9th, nineteen eighty seven. It's not that he hadn't dealt with these things, but you know whose attention this is going to grab. Now, on this day, on the back of the Muslim Journal, two ads associated with uh, masonry. Now, I'm sharing this. I'm learning as I'm going along, too. Now, here on the back of the Muslim Journal, uh, after our meeting, here he's going to speak at the Masonic Temple in, in Ohio, rent that for a public address, on the 8th and a week later at the Scottish Rite Auditorium there in California. So, of course, I'm taking note of that. As he told me, he, he would support me indirectly on this here and uh, keep that between me and him, that conversation, which I did um, until, the day he, until the day he passed. But my point is, I have learned more of the connection. I'm, I'm young then, and I'm addressing it, I got to say, from standpoint of us in the nation of Islam and our lessons, not realizing it was a lot deeper than I, than I knew. One thing I noticed, even what he said to me, and I would pay attention, even if he had any issue with it, he'd say, it's a society that does a lot of good, like the Shriners and the Masons. They do a lot of good, you know, but it's also a secret society. So uh, I'm looking and seeing he's constantly saying that they did a lot of good and they do a lot of good. And I came to understanding they had did a lot of good to help uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and help our community in the early days. So I continue. And in, uh, in 1988, um, we see a book review of the book Al-Islam, Christianity and Freemasonry in the Muslim Journal. But in that same year, I write another book, the book on Abraham and another one on Freemason. Now, I write this book in 1988. And of course, I give a copy to Imam W.D. Muhammad. It was in Atlanta when I gave it to him. 
and um, uh, and we're still working together on this. I'll show you the date in this. You see, 1988. Now, one thing I did learn concerning the secrecy, well, e even if they don't want to reveal a secret and you have the knowledge, then just go ahead and publish the knowledge. And so I kind of moved away from the whole issue of secrecy. And then, like I say, keeping up with the imam, uh, 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 I, I, I grew to see things uh, even even differently because I didn't, I didn't realize the uh, positive impact that they had within within our community. But this is the book I wrote in 88, gave it to the imam, and then you'll hear something that he says about uh, this issue, um, not, not issue, but about the, the Shriners and the Masons in 1988 in Philadelphia. Something addressed this uh, in that same year in Philadelphia. Um, you heard it before, I'm gonna play it anyway, but it was in Philadelphia uh, the program you the title, yeah. as you can see, was Productive Ideals and Religion. That was uh, October 23rd, uh, 88, if you don't have this tape and you can get your hands on it. Okay, so you saw the book was in 1988. We pass it to the Imam. Just showing you a little sequence here, okay? And October 23rd, uh, 88, if you don't have this tape and you can get your hands on it. Okay, so you saw the book was in 1988. We pass it to the imam. Just showing you a little sequence here, okay? And then you'll see in here what the imam said uh, concerning the masons and the shriners as well. Just the consistency. <laughs> This isn't something that we should uh, just pass over, right? But my emphasis here, um, just quickly, is 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 the year um, that this was October twenty third, nineteen eighty eight. Um, the same year I wrote the book and gave him a copy of this book. Now um, and then I spoke in Detroit um, on October. Uh, 29th, my mother's birthday, actually. So we just want to play a clip of that. Just showing us uh, how succinct. I really just uh, want to show this connection in um, 1988. As you can see, October 29th, 1988, here in Detroit, uh, they invited me. As I was saying, just showing this connection in 88, and this is on the street corner in Detroit. <laughs> Uh, they invited me to speak on the same subject, and we had just written that book, and you see October and October, right? Now, again, my main point, and I still don't know the historic connection with uh, the history of the Nation of Islam and 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 the Masons, and how they uh, how our community um, was connected to that.
and see what was the fate of those who came before you. So we are begging as Muslims and as human beings to acquire knowledge and to travel. Now when you talk about traveling, as you travel, you see new things. It's movement, it's motion. You see new environment, you new experiences as you travel. So traveling suggests learning. It doesn't necessarily mean to physically travel, but we can read a book, we can observe things, and we can travel, and we can learn. So Muslims are to travel. People are to travel and are to learn. And I'm trying to go straight into the subject because of the time factor. Otherwise, I have this other long introduction, etc. Okay, we have Trump. Some concepts I have to go straight to right away. I think it's important because our discussion is on, as they call it, the Muslim Masonic connection. And I must say that I haven't made the connection. As a Muslim, I haven't made the connection. I'm just sharing with you some things that I've studied that I've come into. For nowhere in our religion do we learn and study, and as we advance in our study, do we become Masons, do we become Shriners, and nowhere in our Islamic studies do we take on any Masonic regalia or anything like that. So our study doesn't necessarily connect us to any Masonic teachings or Masonic symbolism. However, the Masonic order itself the connection with our religion. Therefore, if it makes a connection with our religion, it is important for us to know what that connection is. And it's important for them to know precisely what the aspects and the seriousness of that connection is. So, I thought it was very important to look into Freemasonry for four basic reasons. Freemasonry uses the Quran and Islamic terminology as they advance up to what they call the Shriner's Degree. Now the Shriner's Degree, in order to become a Shriner, you have to either be a Knights nice Templar on the York right side, there's two sides, they come up the compass, or a Sublime Press of the Royal Secret on what they call the Scottish right side. That's the 33 system. In order to become a Shriner. Now, in becoming a Shriner, what that is, a Shriner is one who is a member of, if you're Caucasian, of the ancient Arabic order, of the nobles of the mystic shrine, or if you're Prince Hall or African American, is the ancient Egyptian Arabic order of the nobles of the mystic shrine. Now, as a Shriner, he travels, as we started out. He travels as a Muslim travels. He travels from west to east in search of life. Although the Muslim does not travel specifically to the east, it just so happens that the Kaaba is there in the east. Allah tells us,
Jones and Brown, and they have the slinger over it. And they have the space. And they have the pyramid. And they have many. They have the fairs, like the fellows sitting in front here. And they have the pyramid. And they have many. They have the fairs, like the fellows sitting in front here. So like the North American fair. And they come from Morocco. And it was a, a similar scholarship. And they're called nobles. A noble of the mystic shrine. And nobles were those scholarly people. Now we're talking about the Masons. A Mason is one who does the labor, the brickwork. He lays the foundation. He builds the But you need to oversee the foreman, etc., the scholarly person. So this is where the shrine is. And the connection that they make here which I haven't found any documentation in the Islamic history, is no Khalif Ali, the cousin and son-in-law of Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ali met no one left. So they adopt that name, Ali, a noble of the mystic shrine. So that is one reason. So if anyone ever asks the question, why would a Muslim be interested in Freemasons? should be concerned because they make a connection. As they go up the system, they make a connection. So as Muslim, we should know that we should be aware. A second reason is that some historians, many of them trace it back to ancient Egypt. They say it began there at the time of Moses, and some go back further with the pyramid, which we find on the back of the American dollar bill, which inshallah we'll discuss. That's another reason, because we are descendants of Africa. We come from various parts of Africa. So if it traces itself back to Africa, and that's where we originated from, or that was our motherland, then we should be concerned from that premise. A third reason is, many of our African American leaders now have been and are today members of the Messiah order. And if they call themselves leading us, and we accept many of them as our leaders, then we should be concerned with what they're being taught, what some of their system of belief are, what their values and what their insights are, and how they perceive our religion. A fourth reason, and since we are in America and we consider ourselves Americans, is that many of the founding fathers, George Washington and many of the others, the signers of the Declaration of Independence and the framers of the Constitution were Masons. And many of those in leadership today are Masons. And since we are American, and they have views on us, and their value systems, etc., affect policy, then we should be concerned. As for myself, in studying, being a student of public administration, we study political science, and we have to learn about the founding fathers. Learn about their values. Learn about uh, their family life. Learn about things that affect them. So these are four basic good reasons. So, let me know more quickly. Masonry, there are basically two types of. So, following what the Imam say, this is not something we should overlook. I'm just sharing how I was uh, continuously dealing with that, but still not knowing the connection to our community. That was 1988. Now in 1989, um, we have another dialogue. This time it's in Little Rock, Arkansas, actually where Imam Muhammad was living uh, then um, with his wife at that time, the mother of, of his younger son, Muhammad. Prince Hall, Freemasons, uh, and Muslims established dialogue. So now we have a second uh, dialogue, okay, and um, I'll play a I'll play a clip from that. Now, doing this, um, the 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 person we was having the dialogue with, the spokesperson for them, and and his book reviews was saying that there was a connection with the um, uh, Nation of Islam and Prince Hall Masonry, 
but I think I took it like they was trying to claim the um the, the good work that we had been doing. Um and so so I was I was I was debating that issue. Um but to find out later from listening to Imam Muhammad, et cetera, and further research that there was that connection. Now I'm trying to share this in some kind of chronology, you know, from the eighties on up. And then when Imam Muhammad uh, uh, shared some knowledge as far as the, na the, the Masons in our community in, the, in his later years. And that we have uh, several young men that's uh, conducted this particular workshop. I tend to find poems relevant to the occasion. And this poem is by uh, Langston Hughes. And it's called Mother to Son. It says, Well, son, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stairs. It's had tacks in it, and slivers, and boards torn up, and places with no carpet on the floor. Bad. But all the time, I've been a climbing on, and reaching landings, and turning corners, and sometimes going into the dark where there ain't no light. So boy, don't you turn back. Don't you sit down on the steps cause you find it kinda hard. Don't you fall now, for I'm still going, honey. I'm still climbing, and life for me ain't no crystal stairs. Today's world for the black man Young man, life ain't no Christian style. They're catching the devil. And thank God we got young men still working, and maybe they will be the role models. So at this time, I would like to present to you Mustafa El Amin, Arthur El uh, Islam, Christianity and Freemasonry. Arthur Freemasonry and uh, Egypt and Islamic Destiny. With the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, I bear witness there's but one creator who we call Allah, and I bear witness that Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah is his last and universal messenger, seal of the prophets, a common mortal human being like ourselves. I'd like to greet you all here in the language of peace, of assalamu alaikum. I'd like to thank Grand Master Woods here of Arkansas, Brother Walks, President of the Philaxa Society. I'd like to thank you for extending to me an invitation to participate once again in your session. I'd like to thank Brother Uzzle also for participating along with myself in this particular workshop. I'd like to greet all the brothers here and thank you for being in attendance. Thank Imam Johnny Hassan from the Islamic community here in Arkansas. I'd just like to make a statement in respect, and that is that, as you know, some of you are not a Mason. I've never been a Mason. In all respect, and I don't have a desire, a, tend a tendency to become a Mason. And that's not in a negative sense. I just want things to be clear about myself because I don't want to present myself as something that I'm not, and that I'm, I'm not. I don't call myself a Mason. I'd like to move on by saying that in light of the current events that are developing in the world today concerning the Islamic religion and this book called the Satanic Verses, which uh, many Muslims are offended by, and Christian Jews and Muslims should be offended by certain statements that are made about Prophet Abraham in this particular book. But Muslims are particularly offended because they appear to be, there is some mockery making of the Prophet Muhammad, who is a mortal human being, but one whom we respect, we emulate, and we see as the last prophet from God. So in light of these recent developments and some of the mockery of the religion, and as you see the outcry by Muslims, I just think it would be very appropriate to caution and just mention as a brother to a brother to those of the Shrine House to be mindful particularly of some of these statements and the prank section, which may be offensive, which are in fact offensive to the Muslims. 
I think this is a good time to mention that, and the statements I'm referring particularly to, as I, I mentioned before about two years ago, respectfully, is the statement wherein it says, who but Muhammad mingled his religion with his whores, his women, and said, this is indeed, power, uh, these are the sources of happiness. Now, that's not correct in that Prophet Muhammad is not the author of the religion. And furthermore, he did not mingle his religion with any women. See, that, that's, that's, it appears as mockery and is definitely offensive. And if it was made known publicly, there could be some repercussions which none of us need at this time, particularly as African-American people. The other situation is concerning the association of kissing the black stone there in Mecca. The Muslims, as they travel to Mecca, and they either salute or kiss the stone if they can as a respect not to the stone, but the association of kissing that with somebody's hind parts is definitely an off offensive situation to Muslims, and I just want to bring that to your attention at this point in light of what is going on now. We definitely would not appreciate anything like that, and uh, I know the, the broader Muslim community doesn't appreciate anything like that. Uh, I know there's a section in your ritual, shrine ritual, for pranks and for other serious things, and we're just asking that the prank that Islam does not, uh, if you will not associate those type of pranks with the Islamic religion. We very seriously and humbly ask you that. And we're all men here. We're all men. We can talk to one another straight, right? There's a place for seriousness and there's a place for joke. And that, the religion, is serious. It may be a joke to some other people, but we can just ask you now, whether you omit it or not is, is entirely up to you. But in light of what's going on today, I thought it would be very, very good to mention that. And now I'd like to move on. Our holy book is the Holy Quran, again, and we believe it's a pure and perfect book, the last revelation. And in this book, it says, in the alternation of the night and the day, in your cells, in the heavens and the earth are indeed destructive signs. That's what this Quran says, for men who reflect. So I'd like to move from there and talk about some of the signs. And as you see, my book, Freemasonry, Ancient Egypt, and the Islamic Destiny. It represents a movement, a growth of man. It represents a progressive movement of man from his beginning stage, the Adam man, the innocent man who was not aware of his environment. So he was subjected and he was a victim and naive and easy to be tricked by the serpent because he was a youthful person. He was the beginning stage. And in our beginning stage, we don't know the experiences of the society. So we are easily to be tricked and to be duped. And this is what we can see has happened with Adam. But what I want to point out here is the sign, the sign of light. The Quran is called light, al nur. The Bible says in the beginning there was darkness, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. So now, what do we see? God put three great lights in the heaven. In your orders, you have three great lights, the Bible, the compass, and the square. The three great lights in heaven, which are real lights, that impact our bodies that impact our emotions, that impact the world. The sun there in the heavens, it strikes the earth, its rays strikes the earth, causing it to spin, creating tranquil force or gravity. And it pulls, it pulls on the earth, it pulls on us, it pulls, it affects our complexion. You plant the seed in the ground and it pulls it up, it draws it up. The sun draws and pulls, it gives life to the dead. So one sign of this sun is freedom and responsibility. Therefore, as in your lives, you say the responsibility. Where does the worshipful master sit? In the east. Why in the east? Because as the sun rises in the east to govern and rule the heavens, so does the worshipful master sit in the east to rule and set the craft at work, etc., etc., etc. So when you make this association with the sun, this should let us men of intelligence, men of enlightenment, know that our responsibility is to teach the people, is to have an influence on the people, to have an effect on the people, to raise the dead as that plant seed is raised. The sun gives us what? Vitamin and protein. It strikes the plants and the plants do a process of photosynthesis. It transfers that. It transforms that into energy. So the responsibility of enlightened people, of enlightened people, of men who have walked in the light is to share and to propagate the knowledge and have an impact on the world. Let us keep going. Now we say the three great lights 
if I could have some water, the three great lights of a Bible, the compass, and the square. The Holy Quran tells us of a man, Abraham, he was seeking to know God. He was seeking to find the God. And it says he looked to the heavens. And the first thing he looked at was a star, which was a small light. And he said, this is God. He was seeking to know a rational attempt. He said, this must be God. But when it set, he said, this cannot be God, for my God does not set. But mine, this was a light. This was a little light. Let the juices flow. Okay. And talking kind of fast because, because of the time factor here. But as I was saying concerning the light, Abraham looked at the light, which was a small light. He was seeking to know there in the heavens in darkness. He wanted to grow. He wanted to see and find his God. But when it said, he said, this is not God. Then it says he looked to the moon, sitting there splendor. Now the star is a small light, right? Now the moon appears a little bigger, right? So he sees more light. And that's what you're seeking, from light to more light. So when he looks at this moon in the heavens, and the moon has an effect on the waters, right? It draws the water up in a fine mist that we cannot detect into the heavens, and it causes it to form clouds and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? It affects the tidal waves, and because we're 60 to 90 percent water, it affects our being also. So he looks at this and says, oh, this must be God. But then when the moon set, he said, no, this cannot be God because my God will not set. Then he looks to a bigger light. A huge light sitting there in the day, splendid in the day, saying, this must be God. But when it set, he said, that cannot be God, for my God will never set. So he concluded by rational deduction, by reasoning, that the power behind the rising of the sun, the rising of the star and the moon and the setting must be the creator, must be the true God. So how did he arrive at that? Through rational pursuits, through his natural progression. And we believe that Abraham typifies the rational urge in man, the rational pursuit in man. And he's called what? Father Abraham. He was called Abram, but when he sacrificed the lamb, the lamb, and his willingness to sacrifice his son, he was given the title Abraham, which meant father of the multitudes. Now this is one father, but we have another father, which was Adam, which represents our original sensory physical beginning. Adam was the original man was the original sensory aspect in us, but that naive, untaught mind. So here come Abraham, another father. See, we have to be innocent too. We have to be sincere and innocent. But on the other end, we want to be able to see rationally. We want to be able to come to some rational conclusions. So we see this rational urge in Abraham, and he's brought to the reality of who the true God is. Then we find that he took that message to his family, to his people. But from there, he went where? Into Egypt. It said he traveled to different places. He went to Egypt. But see, you just couldn't enter Egypt. You couldn't just walk into Egypt. In order to enter Egypt, you had to break the riddle. See, there were several riddles. One was the riddle of the Sphinx, and the other was the riddle of Isis. They had various riddles. See, but to get into there, you had to break the riddle. You couldn't just walk in. You had to know how to knock, right? You had to either enter on the four points of entrance, right? Temperance. You have to have restraint, control of yourself. You have to have fortitude, right? You have to have the fortitude, the courage. Or you have to have, or in addition to that, you have to have prudence, which is what? The ability to govern and rule oneself by the use of reasoning. And then you have to be a man of justice. You have to be a fair man by your brother. That's how you enter this society. That's how you enter ancient Egypt. Now, but he went into ancient Egypt, it says. But in ancient Egypt, they had some mystery systems. And the mystery systems were patterned after a character, one called Osiris. The Osirian mystery system and the Isian mystery system. Now, Abraham, this man Abraham, he had already looked at the sun, right? He had already looked at the moon. Now, this other book I wrote is on Abraham also, so that's why I'm going into Abraham, but it's very appropriate, <laughs> okay? There, right? Listen, listen, but Abraham, when he went into Egypt, now, the Osirian mystery system, Osiris was a god, a mythological god of Egypt, and their system was associated with the sun. So on your dollar bill, you find this eye there on the pyramid from Egypt. Because there at the top of that pyramid symbolizes Osiris, who was rep represented by the sun and by an eye. But the sun, as we say, draws, right? 
it raises, it pulls it up. Now, I got to skip around because of the time. Now, it's pulling him up, it draws up. And who do they say? Rose Haim Abif, the widow's son, after he was slain by Jubilee, Jubilo, and Jubilum. They say it was Solomon. S-O-L is a play on solar, on light. So you need light to raise the man up. But what was he raised to? He wasn't just raised on the five points of fellowship, then buried on the ground floor. He wasn't just buried in the middle chamber. He was buried in the sanctum sanctorium. He was buried up in the higher regions, right? At the third level. Now what happens when you go up to the third level? When you go up higher, the higher you are on a building, the wider, the broader your vision goes. On this level, we can just see but so far. The higher up you go, the further out you can see. So this man, this man was raised up to a higher level to expand the vision. Now, at the top of this pyramid, there's an eye, right? Because as you go up, your vision increases. Where else are you going to put the eye? You don't put it at the bottom. You put it at the top. And there's the light that draws it up. Now, at the base of this pyramid, there are four elements, right? There are four right angles. There are four corners at the base of this pyramid. And this is where we began in four. The riddle of the Sphinx. Sphinx is said, what creature? Walks on four, then on two, then on three. And it was man, because we start out crawling on four as a child, as a baby. Then we stand up erect, right? Then we stand with our heels together erect, two, two legs, right? Then we walk about. Then we get a little weak, and we need a staff. We need a cane to walk with. That's the third leg, right? So we got four, we got two, and we got three, right? In the Holy Quran, in the Muslim book, it says he has made angels with wings, two, three, and four. And our salat, our prayers, consist of four rakats, two rakats, and three rakats. Now, in masonry, you know the three is very important. The master mason, right? The inner apprentice, the fellow craft, et cetera, et cetera. Jubilee, jubilo, and jubilum, right? These are very, very important aspects. So now, on this pyramid, which is the American dollar bill, here we see at the base of this pyramid, we see these angles coming up, you see? But these, these four represented fire, water, air, earth. These were the four major elements in the universe. And they were associated with the tetragrammaton, Yahweh, Jehovah, which is broken down into four, the tetra, and the human being. The human being in his nature, he has four. He's a rational man, which is associated with the fire, that wisdom, it breaks things down to its primary stage. So you can see his original origin. He's a man of moral nature. That's the water. He's moral. He's, he has moral disposition. That is the water. Then the material, the material aspect, which is his material acquisition, his material body, and air, which is his spiritual nature. Excuse me. You know why my hand is shaking. Nevertheless, we move on. They have four freedom awards. Four Freedom Awards in this, in this society, which was established by Roosevelt. Freedom of speech, right? Freedom of religion, freedom from fear, and freedom from want. So this is a foundation. The foundation consists of four. So when you come into Egypt, in order to enter Egypt, you need to know something about your original nature, your origin, which began from four. The foundation of a building is four. So before you can enter Egypt, you have to know yourself, know something about yourself. Before you enter America, they say in order to get into America, modern Egypt, get yourself a four-year education. Get yourself a good college education, and you can make it in America. Get a four-year college education, freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior. Then you can make it in America. This is a pattern that after ancient Egypt. Then what's the next two? You come on up and you find out there's a separation of church and state. You find out that there's the government, and you find out there's the church. This is the two. This is the two that you come into. The two eyes, right? The two ears, right? And I had to tie it in. They say at Solomon's temple that they had two columns, right? One on the right, one on the left. One called Boaz, the other called Jason. And they say combined together, it represented a promise that God made to David that he would establish his kingdom in strength. But these were two men. These were two men. Not just columns, but they're men. And men represent a personality, a body of knowledge, because each of us have our own experience. And in your degree, on the first degree, the hit on the knuckle is Boaz. The second knuckle is Jason, which tells me that it must have something to do with the hands. It must have something to do with the hands. 
In the hands of man is his action. It's used for his action in carrying out things. The left hand has been associated with the weaker part. And the right hand has been associated with the stronger part. So these two things here, the left and the right, the two columns for entering the temple, which we have here on our head, the temple, but not the physical temple, the temple that is built without hands. The temple that is built without hands. And that is the subconscious and the conscious man, the physical and the material. Now let me just wrap this up because I the see the time has run out on me. Few points I want to make. It done ran away on me. The time has ran away. I got my signal. So what can I do? I got to respond to the sign. <laughs> so 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 let me let me just wrap it up because I said the Islamic destiny. Man is on a course. He's on a progressive movement from his beginning stages. And you say, which way are you traveling? From west to east in search of light. And you're traveling, your shrine is of course the burning sands to worship at the shrine of Islam. What is sand? Sand is matter that has been so granulated, so broken down, that it has lost its cohesiveness. It has lost its adhesiveness, its ability to stick together. So sand represents not only the hot sand, it represents the struggle, represents the opposition, but it represents instability. And the Bible tells us of a man who built this house on the sand. And when the winds and the rains came, right, it blew his house down. But I'll tell you of another man who built this house on the stone. And when the rains came, he had a solid foundation. It didn't affect it. So you're crossing the sands. You're moving across instability, speculation. You're moving across insecurities, but you're heading at a house. You're trying to get to the shrine of Islam. You're trying to get to the Kaaba, right? Which is not sands, but it is brick. It is a structure, a square structure. So you're trying to get it from instability to stability. So the struggle for man is from roughness, from that rough crude stone to that perfect ashlar, right? Then on up to the trestle board. So our movement is from simplicity to sophistication. Our movement is from ignorance into the light. It is from foolishness and frolic into great virtuous principles. So along this course, you want to worship at the shrine of Islam. What they say? Did you walk or did you ride? I rode. What did you ride? I rode a camel. What is a camel? The camel is called a ship of the desert. He has mastered the desert. He has the intelligent pursuit on the desert. He's not stifled in his movement on the desert. So this means that the man who has that characteristic of the camel, if you ride your intelligence across the trials and the tribulations, if you ride the camel across the rough road, if you ride the camel across, the instability means using your intelligence. Then you can get to where you're going. But in Islam, it's not the intelligence doing hard, because you have to tie that camel. It says you tie the camel, then you walk the rest of the way. You don't bring your necessarily your intelligence before God, because God has established certain provisions. I may think you should sacrifice a pig, but he may say sacrifice a lamb. It's just as Moses came to the mountain with his shoes on. And God said, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. Don't come here with the knowledge of Shu. In Egypt, there was a God called Shu. And he represented the heavenly earth, the heavens and the earth. He was asked between the earth and the heavens, the air, the air God. So he said, don't come to me with no mythology from Egypt. Take off Shu. And I want you to stand on holy ground. And what's that you got in your hand there, Moses? Cast down that rod. And he cast it down and turned to a serpent, right? This is the knowledge that he had gotten from Egypt, but he didn't know what he was walking with. And I suggest to you, brothers, in my conclusion, that as we walk and think we have support from people, and think we can lean on them as a staff, be careful, because it may not be support. It may be a serpent, and God has to teach you about a serpent. And the proof of it is that the American society has proven beyond a shadow of a doubt many of the white supremacists that they have taken on the role of jubilee, jubilo, and jubilum. England, France, and America, they ripped out our hearts. They ripped out our emotional connection for one another. They ripped out our language. They cut our throat, right? They stripped our language. They stripped our ability to articulate with one another. But what else is there? Is where the air comes. They tried to connect, disconnect our spiritual connection with life. They said we had no soul. And they hit us in the head like they did high or biff, right? Stripped us of our culture, stripped us of our knowledge, and buried us in a shallow grave where we couldn't be pulled up, where we couldn't move for ourselves. The last point, hopefully, I know you're going to close me out. The last point is this here, that when Hiram was buried 
who raised them? Was it the perpetrators of the crime? Was it Jubilee, Jubilee, and Jubilee who raised them? No, it was his friend, not the perpetrators. It was his friend who said, Mahabon, Mahabon, Mahabon. Was there no mercy in the bone, huh? Was there no marrow in the bone? Oh, no, oh, God, my Lord, how could you kill these men like this? How could you kill this great builder like this? So let us not expect the perpetrators of the crime. Let us not expect those who have put their foots on our neck, those who have lied to us and lied on us, those who have told us we cannot read, we should not write, we should be subjected to their system, subjected to their cruel form of slavery. Let us not expect these people who told us, don't read our fuck your eyes out. And then when they allow us to read, they selected for us what we should read and what we should not read, what books are good for us and what books are not good for us. Let us not expect these people to raise us from a dead level to a living perpendicular to the square. They have never met us on the level, never on the level, the level represents equality. Tell me one case where these people have truly met us on the level and upon the square. They have never met us on the level and upon the square. They have never given us the plumb line of right thinking, have they? They have never done this. They have never given us the mallet of understanding to chip away at the stones. Now I'm here as your brother. I'm here because you have invited me and I appreciate that. And we're trying to forge some unity and some dialogue. But I say to you, brothers, I ask you, whenever that old snake of divide and conquer pops his head up and tries to tell us which one of our leaders is good, which one of our leaders is bad, when that old white supremacist pops up his deceitful head and use that old strategy of divide and conquer, we should recognize it, we should kill it, and we should cast it like they did the keystone, not in the rubbers, but into the universal graveyard and set up guards out there, right, in the form of self-respect in the form of dignity. So if it try to raise up out the grave, we kill it again and again. And we should never let these people divide and conquer us. They will pretend to be our friends. They will pretend to be in our ranks. But they will tell you that another leader is not good for you. They are not the ones to come into our house and tell us what man is good for us or not. They have not the capacity. They have not that experience. They have not the same genetic experience that we have experienced to tell us what leader is good for us and what leader is not good for us. What they have that God, that they have that superiority, that God has given them some, some parental right over the African American people to make them think that they can tell you who is good for you, what leader is bad, what leader is good for you. No, they are wrong. They have not that, they have not that. And we as men, we as intelligent men, we as upright men, freedom fighters, and free men, free masons, free to build yourself, free to build your character. We should recognize that, and we should isolate it, for there's not a Caucasian on this earth that can love you better than I can, and that you can love me better than, than, than he can. There's not one on this earth. I don't care whether he's sitting here or whether he's out there. There's not a man on this earth, a Caucasian, that can truly do that, no matter how sincere he is. And not that we should disrespect them, but when they step out of line, we should put our foot on them and don't give a damn. Peace be unto you, assalamu alaikum. <laughs>
because of the research I've done and the articles I've written, I have gained somewhat of a reputation as an authority on Islam. Uh, and all I, uh, I don't have any questions, uh, just a statement, short statement, how I have seen this young man grow. Um, and not only that, I have seen the transformation of thought coming from the Muslim community in regards to other religions and more especially Freemasonry. There is only one thing missing in Mustafa when it comes to understanding the symbols of Freemasonry. And that is the one thing that will always escape him until he becomes a Mason. Just like I can study all the Islamic teachings I can, but until I make that giant step and become a Muslim, I will forever miss the Islamic secret. There is but one secret in Freemasonry, as Jerry Marson Gill brought out, you know, we talk about secrets and it's amazing how people read our rituals and philosophy and say, I got the secret. <laughs> <laughs> My brothers, I submit to you and to Mustafa, to, whose presentation, and you know, he makes excuses for talking fast. Now, it wasn't time that made you talk fast. <laughs> Jeremiah called it fire locked up in the bone. <laughs> Recognize that God is speaking to you. But you see, when you talk about the two, you must understand that Freemasons look upon another two. And until we recognize that two, we, we, we cannot overlook the little pettiness of writers of different thought. Now, brothers, I submit to you that if your religion is as strong as your fanatical expressions, that nothing can be written to shake it. Because when we are received on the master's degree, where well, we have mastered the little pettiness that exists between two brothers, then you will understand the two points of the compasses. And this will escape the, the member, but the mason will understand it. <coughs> love of God, love of man. And until we can understand those two points of the compasses, Freemasonry will escape Mustafa. And the secret of Islam will escape me. I'm not ready to deny Christianity because I, I view it differently from those that do not adhere to it. You view Islam teachings different than those that just read about it. Your books are well written, deep thought. You will always miss the cohesiveness that calls sand to be flighty like it is. And that secret is, what does it mean to you? If there's a question. Yeah, well, not really a question. I certainly, I met you uh, two years ago when I first came to the Philaxis Convention. And I certainly appreciate uh, what you have to say as they do now. And I bought your the book that you read then. I bought three more now, which I intend to get autographs on. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, you know, I've been, uh, I guess I've been interested in religion since I was knee high to a duck. I know uh, um, I used to go to church and I never used to like to sit down with the Sunday school kids. I used to go up, I used to go to Mount Olive Baptist Church on 120 Street in uh, Morning, um, Lenox Avenue. And uh, I think I was about... Uh, 12 or 13. Never just like to sit down in the Sunday school, go up there and sit with the grown-ups and, and, you know, listen to the preacher preach. And I didn't understand all of what he was saying, but uh, anyhow, I listened to him and some of it must have uh, stopped. But at any rate, uh, I look at your religion based on what I've been exposed to as the beginning of like a tree. There's the basic concept of one God, you know, the tree. And looking at the religion itself, we started with the retreat from Costa's roots in Egypt. But then the different branches of religion, there's like the, the branches that branched out. And then, of course, the smaller branches and the leaves and so on would be the different uh, sects or parts of these other or different religions. So that's the way I look at it 
Now, but certainly the concept, all of us profess one God, certainly there is one God, but because as you examine the universe and look at it, it, what a mess would be is if there was more than one people trying, one person trying to make it, or one being trying to make it. So it had to be somebody in power, somebody in power that could say, let there be light and there is light. Thank you. <laughs> um, as you gentlemen are aware, uh, I, I have never made any personal attacks on Chris Hall, the man, in any of my writings or any of my talks. I've never done that. My, my ideals have been against, uh, if anything, has been against concepts, maybe philosophies that we might have disagree on, secrecy, which I made a big thing out of once before when we was in, you know, in Washington. So I've never done that. Right. And I think we as men, we take the, we take the, we take the high road. I said I didn't make any, any attacks against Prince Hall Mason, uh, the man. And in my studies, I've found him to have been a, a, a strong advocate of education, and he has been a strong man for the freedom of our people. And I respect that, and I appreciate that. Upon a man who we hold very dearly, and that is Imam Wartha Dean Muhammad. He has brought us from dark symbolism, and he has put us into a, a greater understanding of the religion, and on the, the Sunnah path, which is the path of Prophet Muhammad with the universal belief in Islam, and he has done much for us and is respected not only by us, but throughout the world, and here in America he has earned the four freedom awards as well as other things. Reverend Allah, and I will, I will <laughs> Listen, thank you very, right, very kindly. Right. 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 Let me take care of it. Okay. Uh, thank you earlier that there is something <laughs> Maybe it ain't I would say this, it's not, it's not two things by now. On the two-headed eagles, a lot deeper than the average 32nd, 33rd degree Mason care to admit. But it's the Olympics. And I'm a fighter. Yeah, I didn't. I, I learned last time. <laughs> <laughs> you so, have grown from that one, and yeah. I appreciate it. So I think that the correction which, uh, right. should be made there. But it's, may I say this, yes, too, you uh, Brother Alameen, uh, that I am very proud of men like you, Mark Dixon, uh, who allows their mind to go beyond structured thought. Yeah. You keep allowing your mind to go there. The fire that is locked up in you will burn brightly one day. You may not be here to see that fire, mm -hmm. but it will burn brightly mm -hmm. because no matter what name we may call him, he has laid his hand on you. You cannot do anything else. <coughs> Amen. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm touched and humbled by your words, and um, thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate the invitation once again. And at this point, I'd like to close out and say, may God bless you all, and may he bless you with understanding, increased understanding, wealth, and a safe travel back to your homes. Peace be with you. Grandmaster Woods, yes, brother. Reverend, and so forth. Could you just give us a brief uh, uh, thought of how you experienced this meeting today? I think, uh, brother Hassan, that it is an extension of the meeting that you and I had over lunch. Uh, a meeting of minds of various backgrounds, uh, of various cultures, and certainly of religious persuasion. And I'm a firm believer that this meeting will be beneficial to me as a minister a, and beneficial to me as a Mason. And I'm very appreciative to God for allowing me to meet you and, and uh, Mustafa El Amin and to hear of the uh, growth that he has personally made and I think that as time goes on he will grow even further. Now what is the challenge that you get from this experience that may change the Masonic uh, view or maybe even help to Muslims to understand Mason? Well in the first place I do believe that he is exactly right in the offensive material that is in the shrine initiation. I'm a firm believer that it should come out uh, however, on the other hand, I think that 
if we are going to exercise a higher level of thinking, that we must learn to look over those bumps in the road. Uh, we are creatures of habit and initiatory processes of our various degrees were there long before we joined the Masonic Order and consequently uh, things are hard to change but always remember that uh, in the uh, vernacular that would be used in uh, describing Ruth and Boaz, what you see is not always what you get. And thank you for your your comments, and I really appreciate it. And, and for my perspective in sharing this, and I appreciate you inviting the Muslim community also to be involved in this dialogue. And I want to publicly also invite you to come to the Master to give presentation any time that your schedule fits and so forth. Thank mm -hmm. you, sir. And uh, who knows, further down the road there, we may share in uh, another lunch. <laughs> and I, uh, hopefully that more meetings like this will take place. And uh, I do believe that there is a distinct connection, as Mustafa El Amin has brought out, between Islam, Freemasonry, and certainly the catalyst would be Egypt. Yeah. God bless you and God keep you. Thank you. Peace be unto you too. Grandmaster Stanley, could you just give an overview of how, how you felt about this last session with Mustafa El Amin? I thought it was an excellent presentation that Mustaf made. Uh, certainly, there were things that he pointed out, as I heard Grandmaster Woods mention about some of the offensive kinds of things that may be within the shrine portions of, of some of our ritualistic uh, presentations. But I think, as I said earlier, that uh, both religion, but as a brotherhood, and of course, secondly, you know, where we all have got to get to is the understanding of, as we go down that path, each one of us see just a little bit different perception, but we're all going to arrive at some point in time in the same place together. Okay, from your experience also, what do you think is a challenge for the Muslim community as well as the Mason community in terms of the future? To continue to communicate because I think that if we continue to communicate with our desire to come as one, we may at some point be able to arrive just there. Thank you, God. Peace be unto you. Brother Stanley, I mean Brother Ted, Todd, would you just give us uh, your overview and who you are and what you represent in this? Uh, I'm Brother James B. Todd, uh, president of the IRS Holder Senior Chapter from Brooklyn, New York. And my overview is that this is one of the best sessions that we've had. Certainly we're in search of more light and knowledge. And we, we know that a lot of the distortions has been going on and that uh, we're placed in a, cer certainly a bad light. And what we're here about is to try to set that record straight and develop some self-esteem for ourselves. Right. And, and you know, what do you think the impact or the change would be for the Masonic uh, Lodge and also maybe the impact on the Muslim community this, this type of dialogue will have? I think it would be for the better, especially uh, for us, because I'm a firm believer that, that the black man was the origin of it all. So no matter which road we choose, it will be better for all of us. Yes, sir. Thank you. God, <laughs> peace be unto you. So I just want to show in, in the midst of all of this here, uh, I did get a letter from uh, Saudi Arabia. As you can see, King Faisal, Center for Research in Islamic Studies. Um, this was 1988, actually. And you can see what they wanted, right? Muslim Masonic Dialogue uh, video, any videos I had on Masonry. And of course, I was send this to Imam Muhammad. But again, I'm still not aware of the uh the connection with uh masonry and uh in our community and also uh it, it was international uh here's a letter from turkey as you can see uh november 1987 that was after the first dialogue uh you can see this is this is from turkey and here uh they're saying uh further to my letter of june 20th 1987 I wish to uh, inform you um, uh, that I finished reading your most interesting book on Al-Islam, Christianity, and Freemasonry, uh, et cetera, okay? But also uh, something that we was addressing, which was a concern with 
what appeared to be a fun making of Islam, we got a letter from the imperial potentate of the Prince Hall Mason, and um, uh, uh, and we had a chance to meet. And I know we we're going on a little longer than I wanted, but here for this was big for the imperial potentate of the Prince Hall Mason, who who um, have, who was there and heard our concern, and he invited us. He said, I received your letter dated May 1989, um, uh, our concern about some of the things that was going on in the shrine that appeared as mockery, and he invited me, and we addressed them also uh, uh, in, in uh, Miami Beach, Florida. Okay, so again, we were doing what we had to do, but like I say, it was into later years, um, and listening to the imam, um, that I came to realize that um, we're looking at a difference when we talk about the African-American Freemasons and we talk about the, the European uh, Freemasons, which are the most powerful, but how the African-American Freemasonry uh, is very, 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 very much connected uh, to the nation of Islam and his teachings as well. And as we started out, W.D. Farad was from a secret society himself, secret order. I'll show just a brief clip of me meeting with the Imperial Potentate. And joining what is right. And for, my name is Mustafa El Amin. I've just read from the Holy Quran, chapter 3, the 104th verse. In keeping with the spirit of the Holy Quran, I'm here in Miami Beach, Florida, to address the Imperial Potentate and the executive and decision making body of the Prince Hall Shriners and Mason. Our primary objective is to present to them some clear concepts of the Islamic religion. And to our secondary objective is to highlight and bring to their attention what appears as mockery in their shrine ritual of the Islamic religion. And ultimately, we hope that this will bring about greater unity between both communities. 1989. God's will.
Is addressing the imperial potentate. appreciated I did all this single-handedly myself and made it all the way to the top and was addressing concerns for our community. And again, of course, we sent it to Imam and we had it in the Muslim Journal. This is December uh, 1989, although this ha that happened sometime in, uh, in, in the summer. But we ran, but we ran that and we did, we did the, um, we had to add the video of the ad. I'm, I'm doing this. Mustafa El Amin addressed the Prince Hall Shriners Imperial Potentate Executive Leadership. And we have this, you men... Call you, this is what I said. You men call yourself nobles of the mystic shrine. Uh, Allah says he created all the sons of Adam in nobility. You have the Holy Quran. Uh, I encourage you to read and study it. My concern here today is to address the mockery that uh, appears in the shrine ritual. And in the imperial potentate, uh, his statement is, uh, yeah, there are things in our ritual, he addresses uh, executive leadership in our ritual that have been uh, dis detected as degrading to the Islamic religion. Uh, this is something that we do not want to do and we don't intend to do. And they promised that they would make uh, do what they can to make that change. But I was doing all this single-handedly myself. I didn't have a team. I was doing what we can. 
Alhamdulillah, Rebbe I'm going to show a clip of a few other things. Then we'll close with what the Imam, like I said, I was doing this chronologically. So later in the year 2000 and on, uh, the Imam said it's Savior's Day, uh, some things about the Masons in relation to our community. Speaking to another group of Mason. Now I'm bringing it up to 2000. Now I didn't know this when I was addressing the Masons until later.
to integrate mm -hmm. uh, into the system of America. Mm -hmm. he, he wanted to separate. Mm -hmm. He wanted those who didn't believe they could ever be integrated. Mm -hmm. Those who had no faith in their future as citizens of America. And those were the ones he attracted. So who did he attract? He attracted black masons. Mm -hmm. He attracted uh, Eastern Star, another uh, secret organization for women. But for women. Mm -hmm. So many of his first followers were from the Eastern Star, women from the East African American, black women from Eastern Star, mm -hmm. and uh, from uh, black masons, mm -hmm. from black masons, mm -hmm. and uh, other, others who were very uh, discontented. So we're hearing some of this, some of this history, and even as the Army Elijah Muhammad uh, said he once was a mason, uh, you can hear that on um, YouTube, the uh, uh, Lost Architect. So I address the Shriners. So I had left it alone uh, in terms of writing on the subject, but as you can see, the Imam continued to inform us of, of that and other things, of course. And here what you see is um, like 2016, I was, I was asked if I would come and address the Shriners. So alhamdulillah, I hope this is beneficial in some way. I know I, I learned a lot. Of course, from the Imam. So here, um, in 2016, um, I addressed the um, international uh, group. Um, I believe they call called International, the Shriners Convention. Uh, I, have, I haven't done this uh, in a while, but um, in, in, showing, in showing this here, just letting, letting us know and remind us that um, this is a part of our history from the Nation of Islam, no matter what our, our views uh, uh, may have been from our lessons. And uh, some may have toned into it, but it was, it was significant and is significant in our history. And we know if, if it wasn't, Imam Muhammad would not have uh, addressed it. But as I said in part one, our brother Chavez, uh, told me this was uh, very important, and but the Imam didn't have time to deal with it in detail, so he most certainly, and I know he did appreciate the efforts um, that I made in um, uh, sharing the knowledge and uh, all that we did with this and addressing whatever issues we may have had and also establishing a, a brotherhood and friendship. So I'm going to play... Uh, here in part two, I thought I could have got it in part. In this distinguishing uh, the African American uh, Masons from some of the history and what we read about Freemasonry in general, uh, good things, negative things. You know, you talk about the Illuminati and all of that. Well, we're not talking about that.
but we know African Americans had nothing to do, just like with Christianity, the uh, 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 the architect or the design and all of that of Christianity, and all of, of this uh, free um, Freemasonry as we received it from the as they received it from the European. Now, in the last book that I wrote on Freemasonry, uh, African American Freemasons: Why They Should Accept Al Islam, I wrote this book here. In, 90, in 1990, uh, uh, this book here was 1990. But here, in making our connection, I even wrote in this book here, um, the former nation of Islam and the Shriners, what did they have in common? I say, um, now let us consider some of the similarities that existed between the old nation of Islam in America um, and the ancient Egyptian Arabic order of the nobles of the mystic shrine, those the African Americans, um, uh, I think Prince Hall, and see what is the possibility that the shriners will embrace the pure universal teachings of Islam. Let us see what is the likelihood of them becoming Muslims, etc. So, um, um, one thing, uh, similarity, they had. Uh, captains, lieutenants, etc. But here, just real quick, the founder of both organizations, the Nation of Islam and Shriners, are veiled in mystery. Farad Muhammad, the founder of the Nation of Islam, has always uh, been somewhat of a mystery man, his teachings, etc. And also with the, um, with, with, with the founder of the uh, uh, Rofel Pasha, Pasha there, there's also a mystery about him. So that, that's in this book here. But what we're just showing now uh, is, is, is that connection, our uh, history and, and the Masons. Uh, is, is, is that connection, our uh, history and, and the Masons. I'm doing that because Imam Muhammad made a point to do that, um, not only to say that they did good, but also to uh, make that connection with our history um, um, from the early days. And uh, brothers are in, the, are in the lodge now, that's your decision, but it most certainly influenced our history and the history of the nation of Islam. Now here in Muslim Journal, um, when I address the uh, shrine, I think the international group, we already spoke with the Prince Hall uh, uh, several times. And this is on the Muslim Journal here. Um, so I'll just play a little clip from, from this here as well, inshallah. Stored, traffic rerouted on a business day because men wanted to parade. White men. They weren't black. Although there are some blacks that do this too. They wanted to parade their Moroccan-looking hats and show off crescents. And the word Medina and Mecca and Allah, etc. And I remember as a youngster in these United States during World War II, or just immediately thereafter, Seeing in the paper where Truman had greeted some people, Assalamu alaikum. The fact is that the Western society has for long been studying Quran, Islamic knowledge, Islamic history, and extracting from it for their own benefit. That's the fact. They stop saying hello and goodbye. They say assalamu alaikum and wa alaikum salam among themselves in privacy. And I heard when they really get up in the high degrees, they stop saying hello and goodbye. They say assalamu alaikum and wa alaikum salam among themselves in privacy. That's what we are told. And that they stop reading the Bible and they start studying the Quran. That's what we are told.
You say, well, did you? Mr. Farrar was one of those strange mystics belonging to secret orders in Islam. Strange mystics belonging to secret orders in Islam. They create a situation to create an effect that will open up the way for the, for the real work to come in time. And they created, they create something that's against the end result. It ain't for the end result, except as an influence. And as a situation to put people in, to put people in, 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 in near the Quran. And their belief is this, that if you have good intentions, and you keep insisting upon what is right, you can preach what is wrong terribly wrong, but uh, the people motivated by, by the spirit of righteousness and the spirit of respect for God, etc., no matter how they perceive God, they will keep their good nature, most of them, they will keep their good spirit, most of them, and if they ever seriously decide to read the Quran, they will be guided by God. And the Quran will save them and put them on the right path. That's their belief, secret order. He was from what is called Pakistan now.